Welcome to another episode of Just Design, JD. JD is a design community created to share, connect and learn. The aim is to democratize design learning. This episode is rich and loaded. Get set to relive the experience and glean years of experience as distilled in the wisdom of our guest. Are you ready? Now, you're welcome. Uh, a little intro of uh, architect uh, Michael Awonowa. Before I do that, just uh, to reiterate what Just Design is about. Just Design is a small community of designers and creatives. And uh, the aim of Just Design is, is to democratize design. And by that, we simply mean we want to make uh, design available for all, both for designers, for non-designers, uh, for aspiring designers. I mean, for persons who are students here, we want to ensure that persons have a grasp of design. And like uh, this, this, this community was inspired by, by my, my personal story where we had the opportunity of learning design from, interestingly, my classmates, uh, my mentors in the industry. And of course, I've seen the power of community in design. Some of the works that we've done uh, have been inspired by the support garnered from, uh, from friends, uh, friends, colleagues who have shared their insights with us over the years. And so I really think that my story uh, shouldn't be for only me, it should be for everyone. Interestingly, our two speakers on this call today, I've been persons who have been part of my design journey. Akitola Yuniga was my classmate. Uh, jokingly, I tell him I, I learned how to draw trees in architecture from him and him only. Interestingly, uh, in design concepts were very influential and inspiring while I was a student. And so I really think I, I benefited a lot from my friends, my classmates. Their work really inspired my design. And I'm really grateful for that. So Akitola Yuniga, I'm telling you publicly, <laughs> I uh, thank you for your support in my design journey. And uh, Michael Awonowo here uh, was also very instrumental in 2015 when we were doing the design for the Faith Theater, like now the Art Legacy Project. Uh, that, uh, interestingly, one of the key uh, uh, 3D images that we used for that project was done by Dami Awonowo. We did the design and we called Dami, or oh, Dami, just put in your own insight. And incredibly, Dami did wonderfully well. So Dami, I'm also telling you in the public, Thank you very much for your inputs to the work we are doing. And so uh, we think that design is a community's work, even though a person can have the idea, but really it takes a community to do a great design. And so that's what we really want to champion at uh, Just Design, to ensure that uh, designers are not alone in their journey. And so that's what we are really doing here. And uh, it's my joy this, this evening to bring up uh, architects. I want to we'll be speaking for about... Uh, for about uh, 15 minutes, and then Akitola will take it up another 15 minutes, and then we can take at the Q and A. So uh, permit me to quickly just share his uh, profile. Okay, it's good to see all of us on the call. Thank you very much for joining in. I can see persons are dummy, and I can see you clearly now. Uh -huh. And so it's good to have us on the call. So just want to uh, be sure that uh, every one of us, we, we are right on the dot. Okay. So just one moment so I can share Adami's profile. Yes, thank you, Dami. So Michael is an avid educator with keen interest in helping people and organizations find uh, pain points and provide solutions to them. He finished from Covenant University from the acting department where he backed the BSc and MS in architecture in the years 2013 and 2015 in particular. He founded a design consultancy startup that focuses on designing the best work environment for brands to maximize productivity. And by the way, that design consultancy is called Mike D. For the past five years, he has, he has researched uh, uh, the connection between productivity and workplace uh, and workplace design in and outside Africa and applied his findings to the work done at Mike D. He has overseen workplace design and, and optimization projects for companies like UAC, Softcom, Piggyvest, PwC, QuickCheck, a quick check, fair money, 
uh, Fair Money and uh, OBN, Organized Basketball Network. And so uh, it's great for us to have Dami here joining this community this evening. And so Dami, uh, you have the floor. We'll be glad to hear your experience in 15 minutes and then we'll take architects for you at Aditola and then we can take you on here. Thank you very much, Dami. You have the floor. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much for having me. Um, hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, is it possible to share, because um, I've prepared um, some slides. Is it possible oh, yes. to share that? Yes, you can. I'll just stop sharing from here, and then you can. So I've done that, so you can, sure. please. Um, so once again, thank you very much for um, having me um, on this platform to talk about my design journey. Um, so I think I'll first start with some, some form of context so people are not confused when I start to um, go through this. Um, so I'll start by just explaining explain what design is to me. Um, so design basically is um, creating, fashioning, executing or constructing according to plan. Um, I'm explaining this because um, I made it a very um, controversial decision um, sometime in 2018. And I said, I did not want to be called an architect again for a while because I was experimenting something. Um, so I'm sure a number of us on this call will probably be architects and um, I got a lot of slack then from my my friends and other people in my in the same design community. Um, but the only the reason why I did that was it, it was weird, but that was the reality. There were some limitations to be tied to architects. It it wasn't um, factual, but that was a limitation. So it was like being a German in the 1930s and 1940s. People would have said you're a Nazi, whether you were a Nazi or not. And I wanted to take away that um, limitation. And that's why I'm explaining design, because I technically I call myself a designer. And then every, everyone that works out of our office, we call them designers and not architects. OK, so just to put that there, um, so I'll just run through my timeline. 15 minutes is quite short, but I'll just run through uh, my story. Um, I'll start from before school. Um, I kind of lost interest in architecture. And sometimes in 400 level, some of us might have um, understand that because um, I think I started to hear some stories about oh, architects don't get paid well and stuff like that. And that was sad um, also because I had to come back from master's and you're doing an extra two years um, in a profession that doesn't pay well. But in that period, um, I then decided that I was going to focus on, I was going to try to figure out a way to get into the industry early. Um, Architecture in itself is a legacy profession. Um, legacy professions are professions that have been there for time. Like they have pretty much standards that govern how they work. So you see architecture, medicine, pharmacy, um, law, accounting. And it's very difficult to disrupt or innovate in industries like that. Usually when you innovate, you still innovate within the parameters that the industry has defined. And one limitation in architecture is that if you don't have a rich background or rich clients, you're not going to go anywhere. And so I was trying to figure out, I don't have a rich background, I don't have rich clients yet, but I, I'm going to try to find a skill that other people might not have. And that would, for me, that was um, 3 days max and creating renders, actually renders first. So I used to do renders in Revit in school. Studio was my best. Studio was my only course. I came to the master's for studio. Everything else was vibes. Not that I did not do well, but you, you get that reality. And in a way, this kind of sets me up because when I finished school, um, I got audience um, with some notable people in the industry that were doing all the renders, um, notably Chrono Studios. And that's where I got my first job. Um, that was six months after school. And... I remember then, if anyone that was in doing that, this was 2015, 2016, Chrono Studios were one of the best um, visualizers in the country. And my goal was to be as good or better. And so everything I was speak, I spent every waking hour working on renders, um, every waking hour working on improving my skill. Now, this doesn't change the fact that I was good at design. It doesn't change the fact that number of, I was skilled at a number of things. But I wanted something that very few people had. And at that point, um, sometime around that period, I think I got really good at it where I could see I was one of the best um, visualizers in the country. And that helped me get the Kronos gig. It also helped me get the next job after that. And that was in school. And that was when I started to learn some things. And 
and this was so that's past this. And that, that was where I started to learn that some skills were necessary beyond designing. For school kind of limits what you learn. And that's why platforms like this are very helpful, especially to students and young graduates. Um, and that's where I started to learn what negotiation was. Um, I used to think negotiation was, or oh, I have to win and the other person has to lose. And then just by looking at other industries, um, not only the tech industry and what young people like myself were achieving, it, it did not make sense to me that I would work so hard because architects work really hard. In school, out of school, we work very hard. But usually you don't get returns for it. And I remember then, that was 2015, the average salary for architects was 80,000. That was very sad. Then, it's even worse then because dollar was 150 then. It was 80,000. That was, that was disheartening. But I was really good at renders and that meant people wanted to pay me more. Yeah? So my negotiation skills revolved around and that was one year after school. And then around that period, I realized something. I, I started, um, oh no, so something happened. I had colleagues from school that were really good um, with schoolwork, created in um, first class BSc, MSc, but they were struggling to get good jobs. But I was getting good jobs and I was getting good offers easily. And so at the point, I started to apply to firms to prove to these people that, oh, work exists out there. That there's no vacancy doesn't mean there's no work. And I remember I applied to a number of firms. I applied to interstate. And I remember the MD making an offer to me. And it was in that meeting with the MD I realized, I think I have something special. Like this is the MD of a firm that's been existing for what, 50 plus years. And the MD asked to meet with me, a young school graduate, to sell the company to me and try to convince me to join the office. And it was in that meeting I decided, you know what, I'm going to start a company. And with my full we'll focus on visualization and we'll charge these architectural companies or charge clients. And that's where I started from. Like literally at that meeting, I left that meeting thinking, I remember on a bus back to my office that I'm going to start a uh, meeting. And quite, um, funny enough, after that, um, the GM of industry reached out as well to try to convince me. And that just strengthened my resolve that I have something to offer. Yeah. And I'm going to experiment what this is. And so after that, I started McD May 2017. And a month later, a friend that I knew, that a friend that knew how well I was good at renders, tried to introduce me to his company, Softcom. So this project you can see on the screen here is the Softcom office. And I remember meeting um, the CEO, then the CEO and the CSO then. Um, and they asked, what have you done? <laughs> and all I had were renders. And there's something I've learned, um, something I learned early on. If you're excellent at one thing, people start to assume you could do, you can do many other things in a good way. Like if you're diligent at one thing, people can, people give you leeway to try out other things. And so I was good at renders. My renders were very realistic. And I could convince them that, you know, let's have, it's young, but what can we lose? It's just paper, it's not going to build it. And then they brought me on as an architect. And that leads to the second story. I remember when I got the project. So you can see it's a massive project. I'm a young school leaver. I had no experience. I went back to <laughs> Kena land and all of my colleagues then, they were, all of us were working on the um, um, Fate Theater then. All of them would join to work on this project. Um, David Dibbe, Shola, um, Bapije, Osage, were quite a number. I did not care that. I remember the bill I sent, the design bill was six point something million. The client called me back, I said he's paying one million. I did not care. It was an opportunity, it was a massive opportunity. So there's a bit of noise in the background. And that's where it started from. And that's where the next um, point I also learned from this. In your process in um, building your career, especially as a young person, there are opportunities you will get that would be beyond, that would be almost like a favor beyond what your capacity is. And at that point, you need to drop whatever process you've built up over time. So if you say, oh, on average, my work takes three years, um, three weeks to do. If you meet a client that's going to change your life, 
and it tells you one to the one week. Don't hold up your three weeks and say, I must do it in three weeks. That's an opportunity to change your life. And I remember then we were diligent with this Softcom project. Like I went for every meeting. This project was based in Ikeja. I was coming from Ota. I went for every single meeting. <laughs> Initially, the client wasn't quite pleased with the design we did. So he brought in someone else, like an, another experienced designer. And in that, um, I'm bringing in that person, and that person was bringing in process, so we do it like this. It just reinforced the, the reason why the client picked us in the first place. Well, these guys are diligent. If I call for a meeting, they don't tell me this. Like, they show up every single time. And that's why we then got, so that's when the client said, you know what, we're going to work with you to do the architecture and design for this project. And then somewhere down the line, contractors fail. Yeah? Everybody at some point, every single project you do in your life, you will have minor challenges. You would make mistakes. Now, what you do after those mistakes is what will define what happens next. And I remember every single contractor made mistakes. We made mistakes, but we came to every single meeting. And so at some point, the client had trust in us. So it was a case of, you know what, build this project. I remember telling them, no, I can't, we can't build it. We've not done anything like this. We're just like three. We can't do this. Like, no, it's not possible. And he said, it's not good to accept no for an answer go and figure out how you're going to build this. And literally, that's how we got the Softcom mm -hmm. project. And okay. seven years from then, that um, approach to work, um, wow. putting everything on the line, sacrificing, has gotten me to this point. Um, typically, there are different types of ways one run a business or a career. Is that you're approaching as a B2C or a B2B. B2C is where you're working directly with the customer. Um, that's where your typical um, e-commerce um, store is. B2B is where you're working with organizations where they are different decision makers. After Softcom, I decided I was going to work with B2Bs alone. Because if you can convince an executive to trust you, or you can convince a group of executives to trust you, to trust you for an extended period of time. If someone comes to them with something cheaper, a cheaper alternative, that it doesn't weigh, it doesn't shake that trust. And that's how over time we're able to do this amount of work in just so maybe it's just five years really we've done this level of work and i think it's beyond this um because this is a bit dated we've done a lot more projects more than this we've worked with multinationals like the un um british american tobacco pwc we've worked with multinationals like uac um i said what um fmcgs like top businesses in the country without any much as a godfather or any backing or what have you. And that just aligns with the fact that if you put your, um, put your foot on a line as far, every project is school in quotes, because that's my approach. Um, it changes your approach to things. Beyond just looking for money, you're thinking, how do I benefit these clients? We've had meetings where I've told the clients, no, don't spend this money. Now, that would have benefited us, but that would have been a short-term, that would have been a, a short-term uh, benefit. But that client today trusts us because he knows, oh, these guys are not necessarily after my money because the value they're bringing to the table is what's um, priority, priority to them. Um, I think I've run over the 15 minutes, right? I think I've exceeded it. Um, Dr. Aladi, can I continue? Continue. We can give you about, okay. five, about five minutes more. Right, five minutes. Okay, fine. All right, thank you very much. I'll just run through it. Um, so I was supposed to talk to just um, two projects. I've kind of touched on um, Softcom. I'll just run through some of the pictures of the projects. You can see how much of a big deal it is. Um, I mean, this is one of the first five projects from Nigeria to get featured on Art Daily, and it was our first project. Like, it changed the trajectory of my career. And this was just because I sacrificed. Uh, we were there every single time for every single meeting, no matter how long it took no matter how far it was. Um, next, the other project I'll talk about is the UAC um, office project. Now, one thing I've learned is money is fickle. Money will come. It will bring value to the table, money will come. The CEO of the UAC project is the third most, um, is the third most, third highest paid CEO in Nigeria of any company, public or private. So, we could have gone into the meeting planning to make money of this project. 
But my goal was simple. I want to learn. If you're this experienced and it's quite young, if you're this experienced and you're doing quite well, then I want to learn from you. So, and this was a stepping stone for us because we're working with an organization that has existed for over 100 years. It meant they had processes. It meant they had defined ways to work. It meant they had worked with more established brands. So almost at the end of every meeting, myself and my team left with something new that they thought we knew how to do. Like, okay, so we expect you people to come with your um, HSC processes. I would not have that. I will literally leave that meeting, go on Google and learn what that is. And by next day, it's ready. So every day we we're working around the clock to be able to communicate ourselves as someone um, or, um, someone of value. And something I learned, no matter the meeting, like we're still young, USC was two years ago. Like we're still a very young team. But every meeting we came for, the CEO was there before the meeting started. It changed my perspective. I know this is someone that doesn't need to be there. Do you understand? It changed my perspective of what professionalism is. Yeah? Because today, um, young people are more excited with making money fast, doing things quick. And sometimes it works out quick. I mean, what we've done in three years, most companies have not done it in 10, 20 years. And that's the reality. So again, it has come quick for us, but then we've worked really hard for it. The team has grown well. Like there are things that have formed my North Star, for example, that, oh, my team will always be paid. It doesn't matter. I don't need to drive Benz. I don't need to drive G-Wagon, but my team will always be paid. So today, McD pays some of the highest salaries to architects and designers in Nigeria, across Nigerian firms. And we're just five years old. Well, all of this has formed the basis for where we are today in the sense of we're doubling down on value. It's not making, it's not getting rich, it's not a get rich quick scheme. scheme. It's not the um, blow quick scheme. It's just we're going to bring value, we're going to provide value, and we're going to learn on the job every single day. And that's what has gotten us to this point. And like that's why I can come here and say, oh, there's, there's benefits. There's value in doing things the right way. And sometimes just putting yourself at the back seat and letting your work speak for you. Yeah, so I think that's that's pretty much it from my end. Um, thank you very much. Wow. That was that was quite insightful. Uh, I think so. I will, thank you. Uh, I think I would just sub zero in on the last point. He said we are doubling down on value. And that was quite that was quite uh, you know. You know, critical. We are doubling down value. I think as designers, uh, a critical thing that we must give the community is value. And as business people, value is what people are looking for. And uh, you know, you mentioned that uh, for every for every meeting, they were always there. That's critical. For every meeting, they were always there. Uh, these things count a lot. And uh, Dami, I said that um, they were, they're a very young company, and that. For him, the CEO, he doesn't have to drive a Benz or a Jewel gun. That's quite, that's quite nice. <laughs> I hope every CEO does that. So, but for the team, but the team must always be okay. And I think that's what really makes a leader. Uh, so Dami, I think you've really given us uh, a, a mouthful of insights. And uh, I think uh, we'll go with a lot of uh, things to think about. Uh, shortly before thank I call, much. thank you very much. We're really grateful. Uh, uh, shortly before I call the next uh, speaker, I would like to also try to share his profile a bit. And uh, I think, okay, yeah, I think Dami is, is off the, the screen now. So I'll just try to share yes. uh, the profile of uh, Agitatola Oyunuga uh, quickly. Okay. All right. And so architect Adesola Yonuga is a deputy head architecture at Prime Tech with over 15 years experience in architecture. He holds a BSc and an MSc in architecture from Cover University. Architect Yonuga is a full member of, 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 of architects and a fully registered architect by the Ar Architecture Council of Nigeria. He's also a professional energy auditor with experience in sustainability and, and energy efficiency in design. He joined the service of Prime Tech Design and Engineering as a graduate architect in 2012. 
acting as a senior architect in the unit due to his performance and dedication was promoted to the position of, of deputy head of architecture in 2018, a position he holds till date. Uh, join me to welcome architect Adisola Oyunuga, Akon NIA deputy head in the <laughs> I think Dola, the, the accolades are too much. And by the way, just to tell the public and the world, Tola has been a good friend of mine for the last 20 years. By the way, we are classmates in the uni. He inspired my design work a lot. Tola, thank you very much. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Wenga, for the introduction. And the acronyms does not matter. The person is the important thing. <laughs> because in the end, it is your character and the, then the value you bring to the table that people will remember you for. And that's what I uh, use to keep myself grounded. Uh, it's good to be here. Thank you for the introduction. Immediately, Benga introduced this program to me. I fell in love with it and told him about what I was already thinking. So it was a very good um, share. And I'm available even beyond this for collaboration and further discussion. So as you heard, I studied at Covenant University. And uh, one minute for a brief introduction. Before going to Covenant University a year earlier, I would have resumed at um, Futa. But the day I went to resume, the, you know, normally in government schools, the um, jambites resumed before the stalites. And when we jambites went to resume, the stalites came and started the riot law and canceled the registration because that year, government changed um, their, government changed students' fees from 1900 to 3000. That's how my story of loud uh, footer ended. And I left that and I thought, we, I started planning with my family that we have to think private. And we were able to, uh, coincidentally, see use advert came in maybe a week after that or that month. And then that's how I went to, and I don't regret that um, situation or that experience and how everything turned around. Because I think everything might have been different if I had gone to another school. I'm very grateful for my time there and the lecturers I met, the, the classmates I had and friends I made because it shaped my perspective and my experience in design in architecture. School, you get the design brief for a project and you have a short time to do it. Normally, my own strategy while I was in school was not to do something, not to design a typical um, structure that I can easily understand. Let's say instead of designing something regular, rectangular, I would go for using circles or arcs just to push myself because I personally understood that in school to an extent you can experiment, but in real life, after school, your ability to experiment reduces or it's more costly. So that was my strategy in school and it worked even with the backlashes of some, uh, sometimes I don't get, you don't get the grades, but other times you get good feedbacks from students and everything. But in the end, it helped me, pushed me beyond my limit, my uh, comfort zone. And it helped my uh, career because after school, you get into the reward and your brief from clients or from uh, employees are somehow quite different from the free hand you have in school. The client, his expectations is entirely very different. They might have all the money in the world or no money at all, but their expectations on design solutions are usually higher. And it's up to you as the designer to try and marry their expectation and bring out their design solutions. I don't have uh, drawings to show you because right now I'm still working with Prime Tech. I can't show company documents right now, but you, with time you see some, some of these projects that have been involved in you, you, uh, you might have seen them or experienced them. When I mention them, you might know some of them, but with time, they'll become public knowledge. So after uni, I went for service, served in Abuja. I was working in interior woodwork and architect Adiboye, our lecturer then called me that, why did you work with my friend I introduced you to LA? At that time, you know, we were always chasing the highest salary and things like that. But I thought about it and it was around the time I was already thinking of uh, joining Akon and Akon registration. When he friend, I jumped at it and he employed me. But one thing I noticed from that working it, I was working in, I'd worked at served with him a little, left because we didn't agree on, on salary now that it's full time, not NYC. 
Hello, everyone. Can you hear me now? Yeah, okay. Yes, yes. Please, what was the last thing you heard? My button went mute by itself. NYC after agreeing on salary. Okay, yeah, so that's fine. Um, so we agreed. I went, uh, I joined, and it was exactly. Hey. Hello? Okay, that's fine. So I joined him to uh, fill the logbooks and everything. And one thing I noticed immediately with this architect was that, yeah, I was going to site meetings and meeting other architects in the profession and everything. But this particular architect, uh, Abayomi, architect Daniel Abayomi, he had a small office. Most offices then in Abuja, they were working out of shops in malls, what you would call shopping center in Lagos. But that's how the typical office here is in Abuja. From his small office in one year, in 20, 2008, 2010, the man was turning over 500 million Naira projects in a year or more than that and things like that. How come this small practice is able to do this? He had the Nike firm and he had a construction company. And just one of them was uh, uh, performing like that. It's not like our salaries or anything, but the number of work we were able to do in that short time, as in, in that office, was really, uh, it caught my attention and it showed me that all the things, all the glitter, all that glitter is not good exactly. That was what that experience cleared in my mind. I was able to uh, perform all the, uh, I was able to be involved in all the different phases, the design phases from concept to uh, post occupancy uh, during construction supervision and everything. So with small projects, because there were government projects and tenders that we had to win, the reality of uh, design supervision, design consultancy, don't do me that all the expectations of my, all my expectations as a student and all the things I, I thought design was, is not exactly what design is. What I learned was you have to understand your client and his brief very well to be able to understand what does the client want, not just my own design intentions and flair or ego and anything bringing it down to understanding the client, understanding cost, understanding time, and then available materials. Because uh, the, it's possible that you present some designs, the client falls in love with it. And then when construction comes, the reality of sourcing materials and building becomes an issue for the project. Some might derail the project, some might stretch the project, and in the end, it might cost your client more. So, I, as at that time, I hadn't solved all the questions in my head and all these things about design, but I was um, noting them in my head and jotting them away and improving as well along the line. Another thing that uh, that built me up that time was, <laughs> you know, you as employees, you would in your mind sign a contract and want to work eight to five. But Aki, as you all know, sometimes you work beyond that. In this particular office, I noticed um, anytime we stayed over on some days to meet some targets, the next day doesn't mean you won't still spend the time to, or you won't still run over time and things like that. So consciously, I started um, putting myself on more pressure. Not It wasn't from the office. It wasn't from my superior or the uh, business owner. But personally, anytime we stayed for that, I tried to even stay more focused around that time because I know if I can do more this, uh, during this overtime, the next day, it is to the benefit of all of us working there that we'll be able to close faster. And in that, that was when I started honing my focus skills or focusing ability. I, uh, my wife would say it's one of my greatest strengths and weakness at the same time. Ability to tune out of every other thing, focus on what you have on hand, finish that and move on to the next thing. It's, uh, it's very easy to lose focus. And one of it is, uh, you, we, it's, uh, if you don't have a good work-life balance, it's possible when you are at work, you sign the contract for something, you are, your mind is divided because you have other person needs psychologically and you are thinking of what do I need to do, what PP or what, how do I cover for that? In doing that, you are there physically at work for eight hours or whatever, 10 hours or anything but you are not contributing. Your value is not up to the time you've even promised in your own contract. So with time, 
um, I was able to improve that. And consciously, I see my own employment as a business. I take it as business. I know it's time. I'm, I'm there with, to offer time and skill in exchange for reward and things like that. But personally, I run myself as a business. When I'm at work, every other thing falls off. I focus, give my time, and keep improving myself. Every year, every year I set a target for myself. I have to learn something new because tomorrow I want to be more valuable to the business than I was yesterday or last day. And I keep tracking myself and things like that. Because next time we need to negotiate salary or anything, I should be able to say, see, this is the value. This is what I do better. This is what I uh, contribute. And that is why I think I should get this, not just uh, I've been here for so, so, so years, so I should get that. No, it's not about time. It's about value, what you bring to the table. So that is one thing that if anybody would take something from me, I would, I would uh, advise that if you are not starting a business, if you're in employment, take your employment as a business. You actually sign the contract to offer something in exchange for something. I know the, um, generally starting salary is very low and things like that. I went through it and I'm in a different place now and everything. There will be time for that and things like that. But attitude and commitment and improving yourself, that uh, will not go. It, as in, it will never go out of go. Because tomorrow in any society, in any environment, people would always demand or uh, require value. And anybody that meets or fills the gap will get the benefits. That's how it works in rural life. So an encouragement in that wise. And then I moved over to Prime Tech after some years, after I had finished uh, cutting our corn and things like that. But one, and it was a big change again because it's a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary office. We have architects and engineers in Prime Tech design and engineering. And it was a whole new game entirely. And it was beneficial to me and I appreciate it to date because unlike uh, normal practice where the architect designs satisfy the client's needs and then you engage in uh, other engineers and things like that, it's, the world is moving away from that. It's becoming more uh, of an interactive, uh, iterative kind of design process where at the concept stage, you try and get in the input. You're not bringing them in as full consultant, but you're getting their input, critical input at that point, so that you build your design concepts and things around that, so that when it's time to build, its uh, construction is faster and more efficient. Overall, you save the client's money, you get his project to the uh, completion on time. Uh, you, at the same time, you begin to work towards sustainability. In terms of the real sustainability, that's the um, environmental considerations, the people, people in terms of your client and the people, the occupants, the users, and uh, the economic value and prosperity attached to the project for the client. So you, you consider all these three things, and that's what we now do consciously at the office. Sometimes we, we use, most times we ask the client, are you conscious about sustainability? Do you want it in your project? At some point, we automatically start building it into the design. You don't even have to tell us, we just build these things, we design it in to favor you. Because in the end, sometimes we, uh, the clients cannot, it's not every client that can detail out their brief to you to make you understand their why's and make you know what makes them tick and things like that. Some may just tell you, I want it to look like this, or I have this budget and things like that. You have to be tactical to understand, okay, yeah, this is what it means. And in his budget and his brief, you try and stay in to solutions for him not exactly it doesn't at that point of briefing you might not have the whole idea in your head but one critical thing that is sure that you need to do is and that that helps me a lot is understand the client understand what they are saying and what they are not saying we had a, a client uh, recently that uh, anytime we finish project we ask the client to give feedback and it's written is documented in our qm and things like that so we can learn from each project and know our weaknesses and improve and things like that. The client wrote in his feedback that I appreciate the design team because they listen to me. They listen to our requirements and we're able to solve and we like the project and things like that. But that uh, struck us in the team that, okay, what we are doing consciously in the background, people are actually noticing it because they are seeing how you translate what they are saying to what to the project that they are living with. So that is something to look out for. And you know, someone once said that if the why is powerful, 
the how becomes easy. That's the thing that clients generally, they actually want a good project. They want a sustainable project. They want it at their price point and things like that. They are not uh, against all the energy efficiency and things like that. But at the same time, you have to make sure you satisfy one other thing for the client, which is what third party, other people think about the client's project. And that has to do with the overall design, the not only the look. When I say design, I'm talking about the uh, building, the utility, form and function, not just what it looks like. It's usually, it's easier to get lost in the form and then overlook the function. But as if you, if you really want to design to satisfy all the users and everybody involved in the project, you have to look beyond form and really focus also on the function. And when I mean function, I don't mean the use of the space. I mean the use of the space and the building component as well. That's one thing that I've really developed while I'm staying in Prime Tech because Prime Tech is owned by Jules Vega and it's a design, uh, a construction company. There are some processes that they've uh, developed over time and turned into standards within the organization and things like that. With that, the, the, the bottom, uh, the long and short of it is understanding the systems that work around the building envelope, the building systems and things like that, so that when you're selecting, selecting materials and specifying, you're actually picking material, not just for the beauty, but for the function. That's why you see buildings built by these companies that last over 50 years and things that, yes, you, you might need to paint and things, but the, the structure will not give way and uh, the elements of the building remain intact for longer than what we are beginning to get used to around the country and you know of collapse and things like that. So focusing and developing oneself to understand the brief, understand the site, understand the building envelope and materials that you can apply in different parts of the building envelope in order to function for the long term and also the aesthetics you are designing for. That is a skill that needs to be developed and there will never be a day when you are the best at it. You just keep developing because new challenges will come you might, you might be used to designing in Lagos and then a new brief comes, you have to design in uh, Kano. It's a whole different ball game entirely because their climate is different from Kano. So you have to understand the site and then design for that because of the uh, size of the company, parent company and things like that. We get to walk across the country, everywhere, every time from residential to industrial. We walk in every, sec in every sector of uh, construction and from design to construction, supervision and everything, we get to work not exactly as it is in New York because Prime Tech is a design company under Julius Vega. So some, some, most of our projects are EPC contracts, EPC in the sense of engineer, procure and construct. So there might be like in the oil and gas industry, the, the, the contracts might come with a basis of design by another architect. And then he comes in, just sketch, and uh, one to hundred drawings and things like that, and some specific some specifications. Our own competency and what I've developed over time is turning around those kind of designs into construction documentation. And construction documentation, as small a term as it is, is a whole lot of <laughs> another game entirely compared to uh, concept designing and things like that. Because you can have one duplex project and your documentation is more than 200 sheets. Literally, I'm not joking. Because of the different kinds of uh, documents you have to provide, because of all the other, the client also has a different set of, they have a project management team and a design um, team. Not, they don't design, they, like an energy, they actually check your design. So we submit drawings, archi, structural, mechanical and major. And on the other side also, they have those teams that will go into your project, check if it is to the, to the design code, Euro code, uh, BS, and all these international codes. And they check and approve and things like that before it goes to the contractor and then the contractor build. So we have to solve a lot of problems on paper before it gets to site, because this kind of projects are so huge that any single day delay is a lot of money. No, we're not talking about millions. It's really a lot of money. So you have to solve those kind of problems, detailing, 
specifying material, you call up manufacturers from anywhere in country, outside the country, you discuss your um, design brief with them and the kind of solutions you want. And then they talk about their systems and what product to work, which one will not work. We talk about which one is the uh, buildability better for this region and things like that. The climatic condition in, our, in, in this region or wherever the client is, some projects are closer to the sea, some are not. If you are not conscious of things like that, you finish a building and in less than one year, your paint, your, your finishes are washed up because it's too close to the sea and the salt has washed up the, uh, has destroyed the facade and things like that. So all those things are not things that you build overnight or on one project and things like that. You, it, it takes a while, but the advantage is if you, or no, not the advantage, it's open to everybody. I have had colleagues, I have colleagues and I was, there, <laughs> but not everybody that performs the same. My own competency is whatever comes, I want to know more at the end of this project than I was when I went into the project. So consciously, I develop myself on every project and I try to learn from experiences of others. As Binga has mentioned, I also call people. I call him, he calls me. I call uh, former, my, the people I've worked with in the past, my colleagues from former offices, and we discuss things. Definitely, I won't talk about the specific of the project because some of these things are bound by confidentiality clauses and things like that. But I gain experience around, that I turn around and put into the project. The most important thing is, as an architect, you must know, no, it's not for you to know everything or know where to get the solutions. That's when you become an asset to your team. And then, okay, if we need to solve this, you can call on this person. You can put this person on the project and because we know we will solve this, we can handle this and things like that. And it helps because not only does it help the team I've been on, it's helped in the fact that I've been called to be involved in other things that like Abraham said, no, like Michael said, you initially you're not competent enough for that, but they think if you can apply yourself to other things, you will be able to apply that same mind to this and it will work. And it has worked for me. It has gained me recognition and things like that, which I appreciate. And I know it's not me. It's just a skill. If you hone those skills, they will work for you and they can work for anybody. And as being as said, the intent of this program is that any designer can learn things that work to improve their own designing skills. And that's the thing, that's the beauty of design. Design is not written in stone. Um, like we know, architecture is science and art. We, sometimes it's, easy, it's easier to get lost in the art and forget the science. And that's the thing about uh, big, the bigger you get in the industry and the, the bigger the project is, somehow the science almost becomes more important because you are dealing with huge sums of money now. Uh, if I'm designing a, if, if you, imagine you are my client, and your project is 100 million naira. If I make a 1 million naira mistake, you can forgive me. But if your project is 5 billion naira and I make a 1 billion naira mistake, two of us won't sleep. So there are different things at different phases. And the earlier you start developing those skills, the better for you. And it will help you in negotiating as well. So if you will take anything from today, I would advise the following. I wrote down some things for you. Let me just quickly point out to you. I would say, don't lose your, um, your, pro your uh, presentation skills. The ones you had while making your studio presentations. I know software is changing. Yes, keep up with software as it's changing and develop your rendering skills and visualization and things like that. But what I mean is, what I'm really referring to is site analysis is actually very important. Not just one page to slap on on your design or presentation at the end and say you've done the site analysis. It's actually studying a site to know what exactly is unique about the site that can influence the design. It's things like that that make design unique in such a way that anybody that interacts with the building will understand, okay, this is the natural system that's happening here. This is unique and I can feel the impact of that design consideration in this project. So keep your uh, defense, uh, project defense presentation skills and improve them as you go into practice. 
whether as an entrepreneur or as a staff, as an employee of another person, because that is actually, uh, that will get you noticed. That not only notice it will make you a valuable member of your team. And you can develop interest and competencies in that. Like uh, Michael said, from rendering into consultancy. So visualization into consultancy. What I'm put, pointing out there is that the visualization is telling a story to your client, not as in a story that brings out, drawing out from his brief, your site analysis, what the client wants, what can be done, your design intentions and, and uh, creativity. And then selling that to the client, not only design, also energy efficiency. Now uh, the country has the BEC, that's the Building Energy Efficiency Code, which is voluntary for now. It was launched in 2017. They say at some point to become compulsory. Stay ahead of the curve, learn those things and things like that. So that that's part of the thing you can put in your presentation and show the client. My design is saving you 40% over business as usual. My design is doing this. So it's quantifiable. It's not just uh, my design looks better, but my design is actually functioning better. It saves you money. It puts this back into your pocket. When you start telling the story of your designs like that, people, more clients will be able to relate to it. That, yeah, this guy cares more, uh, as in cares about my, my project and my finances and things like that, and understand that you're not just there for consultancy fee. You're actually using your design expertise as an architect to solve this problem. Then uh, I would say I iterate a lot. The first concept that comes to mind might not be your, is not always the best uh, solution for the design problem you are trying to solve. Just keep sketching, keep fine tuning. Don't worry about how long, how long or how many um, iterations you have to go through in design and keep an open mind. When people criticize your project, no matter how hard or reasonable it is, take out of what they are saying and look into it, take out the merits and use that to iterate your design because the thing is the more you iterate, the more you refine, the more, the better the design solution at the end of the day. And you would see, and sometimes it will surprise you that when I started this project, I didn't think I would design this. At the end of the day, the solution is even surprising you that started it. So that's something that can be learned. Iteration, doing things over again. Anybody can do that. And it, you can use it to improve your uh, design. Then have a good attitude to life, work, and business. Try to balance everything. Um, nobody wants a grumpy uh, uh, colleague or business partner. In life, generally, you don't want a grumpy friend. You, you don't want uh, a negative vibe around you. You always want to be with the positive person, the one that has the solution or that knows how to get to the solution. Be that person. Be the one that has the value to give. When you have competencies like that, you'll be able to take better things to yourself. And, um, yeah. I, think I, that is, um, I wish you good success and all the best in everything you do. Over oh, to you, Benga. Thank you so much, Akhtetola. Please, can we appreciate Akhtetola in the chat? Let's express our appreciation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So we're just going to the Q&A session now. Thank you, sir. We're just wrapping there. Please, could we um, mute our mic if we're not making a, a comment uh -huh. a so we can get to hear one another, right? Um, what I appreciate our two guests together, Acted um, Tola and Michael. This has been super insightful. Uh, and I know that uh, there's this part of the engagement, which is where people want to ask some further um, clarifications or thoughts they have in their mind and getting the, uh, the wisdom and experience from your journey, because this is really JD, uh, my design journey. Uh, so please, the floor is open. If you want to use the chat button, please feel free to put a question in there. I'm going to pick it from there. If you would like to speak, uh, please use the raise hand button. So we'll just speak to you um, in, in, in that order. But, but before I start, you know, reading out the question or asking uh, those who have, uh, you know, raised the hand to speak, I'll just do a quick overview from uh, uh, some, you know, highlight from what they shared. I remember, you know, humorously when I was coming to architecture, just like Akhtetola mentioned, on the brochure of the adverts, I think it was this picture that I saw. Uh, represented part of architecture, and I was really intrigued that, oh, 
I, I like to meet this person when I come in, but I'm not sure if if we, if Athena knows my face, but I think I saw his picture then the brochure. So from what I, um from what uh, Michael I want to share with us, the CEO Mike D, he highlighted a number of points. Uh, I I just mentioned a few. Um, strikingly, he said something about the power of negotiation, and which is a skill every architect needs negotiation skill, a negotiation skill. This connects back to uh, what Akte Femi showed to go share la last month on Just Design on top of his various certification, you know, he schooled himself in and which literally opened the door for him for afterwards. Uh, he also spoke about the fact that there may be no, uh, you know, that there's no urgency, that there's no vacancy rather does not mean that there's no work. Uh, I mean, I took that, you know, down. That there's no vacancy does not mean there's no work. Um, you know, there's work really, um, and and there's a point that everyone has alluded to, which you know Michael shared. He said, if you are excellent at one thing, people will perceive you to be excellent in other things. If you are excellent in one thing, you know people perceive you to really be excellent in other things, and, and that's a very striking one. Um, you know, so you know, you know, he, he emphasized that if you bring value to the table, no, no doubt money comes in, right? Um, Thank you so much, architect. I will know for that. Oh, can I use the appellation architect? <laughs> oh, I just say Mike. <laughs> All right. You're so, uh, okay. Architectola shared, you know, um, his journey. Um, by the way, Architectola is the deputy head of the unit architecture, prime tech. And Architectola shared something. He said, take your employment as your business. I, I know, I, I, I think Architectola Kemi was also reiterating this last month. You know, because I try to always do a connection between the series we are having. And when Actifem was talking about the fact that one major skill actors lack is financial intelligence. Take your employment as a business. Uh, and Actifem also said something that, you know, um, he, sa he said something that was very powerful. He said, he said, he, he emphasized the power of attitude to life, to work, to business attitude. People buy much of not just the skill, but the attitude. People buying on the skill. People buy on the skill. It's not for you to know everything, right? But knowing where to get it from. So as an architect, it's not about you knowing everything. Ability to be, you know, collaborate with other people, uh, learn from other people. Um, I, I remember with time at Tala, they invited Akitola to take a session on specification, which is something that Akitola also emphasized that that's, you know, it's it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a different ballgame on its own. But architects specializing, knowing into you know uh, the intric intricacies of specification, working to standards, uh, global best practices from whatever project we are on, right? Uh, so I'm just going to go into the the chat box now. Uh, please, let's feel free to drop in a uh, uh, you know whatever. I uh, could it also be a comment. Uh, please, we, we are, you know this is we're minds together in this session. If you have a comment, you you you, you think we we'll, you know we we'll just share that with us um and if you want to also speak maybe ask your your question uh, live on the call please just raise the raise hand button or you could just unmute and speak uh we could just take that before we wrap up i think we're literally uh just have a few more minutes before we close this the floor is open um i think somebody said something here um okay um Akim Musiri says, I learned to be excellent at one thing and add value, then recognition and money follows. I think it's a comment. The power of reiteration and being open to correction and reviews and making work better was a striking point from the second speaker. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Yeah, that, that's, that's, thank you for that. That's very noted, very noted. And a big shout out to everybody on the call. Um, we have amazing minds across the value chain of design you know connected to this experience we value your time and thank you for you know being part of this since we started up um okay somebody sent somebody sends a question here he says um um when did you know when to start your own firm i, I want to believe this question is for um my my b boss michael when did you know when to start your own firm Michael, could you share, sir? All right. Um, so there, there are two sides to it. I'm a very spiritual person. Um, so there's a spiritual aspect where you're sure that, okay, so I have a leading to do this. So there's that aspect. But then also knowing that you're bringing um, 
something to the table, like you can offer services to people. Because um, starting a business is not easy. It's easy to say, okay, I've started a business because then you now have to look for customers. Yeah. And you then, wisdom is knowing how to put out stuff. So then I used to put out um, a lot of, I used to do a lot of um, practice projects with renders, renders that showed where I wanted to be. Yeah, so I remember doing a render, um, something for Stambic IPTC um, for a bank then. It was a smaller project, but then I expanded it and made it bigger. And then I looked like, no one, no one needs to know that you did not do for Stambic. Like you could do practice projects, make MT and your clients. Yeah, in truth, no one needs to know MT and do not give you the work. People you just, need, just need to have an idea that, or you can do something of this quality. Because if you wait for work to do anything, you will not get anything. Um, there's that adage in our profession that nobody will trust you to build anything until you've built something. Yeah. And our profession visualization is, for me, it was the easiest way to start. Yeah. Because you do renders that are almost lifelike. And people start to assume, well, I can imagine what that looks like real. So you know what? Maybe I think you can do this for me. So that that's that's when I knew, okay, let's let's try this. And there was obviously there was always that option of if this doesn't work out, I'm going to Canada, and I'm going to push a career or something else. Do you understand? But like that that's that was when I knew. Okay, so I think it's time to start something. All right, thank you for that, uh, Michael. Um, I think please let me know uh, in the chat uh, the person that asked that to know if that really answered your question fully. If you want. Uh, Michael to buttress on that. Okay, somebody's raising their hand, but let me pick this uh, question on the chat. Akutola mentioned understanding the client materials and time. I'm particular about time. How do you deal with racing against time to meet deadlines and adding value? For instance, you mentioned iteration, carrying clients along and design process, which you know all of this takes time. How do you deal with the, you know, racing against time to meet deadlines? Akitola. Okay. The way to deal with that is to plan for it, schedule. When we have a client and the client asks us for a brief uh, design cost, what we actually do in the office is we schedule our time, the time it takes to do the project and how much resources do we need for that? What I mean by that is in the architecture team, we'll take you, how many experienced architects do we need for this project? How many junior architects do we need? Who starts working when, and when is the other one uh, working? Who is making the concept and things like that? And then we schedule, we make a rough schedule. Uh, in six weeks or eight weeks, we can finish this concept design and we plan, okay, we can make two options, three options or things like that. So even before giving the clients a quote for our design services, in our mind, we've already planned how long it will take us. So in planning for the time and in scheduling, that's when we plan how many uh, weeks, you know, design is front-ended, concept design is, happens first. How long do we have to make this concept? How many options do we have to make at that point? That's how you schedule it. So that when you, we, let's say you plan for two weeks, that means you're leaving yourself with only four weeks to finish the work. So at that point of iteration, everything happens in that two weeks. Once the two weeks is done, there must be a line on the court that yes, at this point we have a concept design, we are comfortable with, everybody has seen it and we have input from other departments and things like that. And then we go forward into presentation and visualization. It's only uh, sometimes it might happen that while visualization has started, we see something better or someone comes up with something better actually that improves the project then we can add that like another step of iteration, but we always keep our schedule. We hardly overshoot our deadlines. And then we commit to it. If, if we have to work extra hours or things like that, just to make sure we get the client, uh, we meet the client's time. But we schedule, that's how to deal with it. Plan for it. You have to know at some point, get good uh, with knowing your skill and your comp competency, and not just competency in drawing. How long does it take me to produce this? If you know it, one, um, visualization, let's say one rendering takes you one day, then you can't give yourself two days to do the whole work. You have to, how many renderings do I have to do? How many of this? And before it can even be modeled and rendered, how many hours or days do I even need to think and sketch before that starts? So when you know how long you need, 
and you can schedule and you can give a realistic time along with your cost for design. All right. Thank you so much, Akhtetola, for that concise and insightful response. Uh, I hope that answers the question, Oyedi uh, Kachuku. Okay, I have somebody's raising their hand here, Akhtet Saleh. Uh, could you unmute and, and speak, please? Uh, good evening. Thank you. My name is uh, Saleh Bopa. And my question uh, is for architect Michael. And the question uh, goes this way. Uh, as uh, young graduates, architectural graduates, what softwares do you have as a recommendation for us in terms of, because some of us get confused. There are a lot of softwares. We get confused on which software to use, you know, in terms of the 3D visualization, working drawings, presentations, what softwares can you recommend for young architects? That's my question. Thank you. All right. Um, hi. Thank you very much for the question, um, Mark Sale. Um, software. So really, the software doesn't matter. Yeah, because you're not delivering to the client on a software. Usually, you're delivering either pictures or a document or what have you. But for me, I know I work with Revit. I work with um, 3ds Max. I know. I know a couple of people that are excellent with SketchUp. I was not a big fan of SketchUp because back then it was going to look like shortcuts. It felt like a shortcut. You get for many people. Um, but today, then there are quite a number of softwares. People use Blender. Um, quite a number of softwares. The goal is not the software. The goal is to achieve something. You get so. For me, then um, there's someone else. People might know Larry Alou. Larry Alou goes as far as buying, like he got a DSLR camera. So you can take pictures of realistic things and try to imitate them. I did not go that far. Do you get? He explored a number of things. I did not go that far because I then went into um, consulting and construction. But the software doesn't matter. But for me, I work with um, Revit and 3ds Max. I know soft um, SketchUp is kind of easier to um, achieve similar results. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I think if I may just add, I think uh, we were having a session around that um, with the directors of Studio Contra um, at the Department of Architecture uh, just recently. And I think a question around this came, especially for young graduates or those who schooled in the Nigerian schools of architecture. And um, they were privileged to school, um, I think, in Harvard and Oxford. And so you can see that, uh, uh, yes, Nigerian architects are good and the graduates are awesome, but um, one of the tools they recommend is, is a tool that focuses on conceptual design. Um, and so they recommended Rhino, um, SketchUp, um, but I think they, are, they tilted much on Rhino so as to give the malleability and flexibility um, for conceptual design, which from their own observation, Nigerian graduates focus more mostly on, you know, um, the INBIM tools that, um, but they, in their own practice, they use that for production according to what they mentioned, but they recommended that for conceptual design. So if, if that's the case, um, you are looking at, at the salad, that's also a tool you can add to your toolkit. But like, I think well, like what Michael said, the focus is not on the tool in itself, even I missed bidding information modeling tools alone. There are several other ones. How yeah. the quality of your competency, whichever one you have chosen, is what separates you out of, you know, from the peak of the pack. All right, Chema has uh, a question here. Chema, could you unmute and speak, please? Um. Okay. Hi. Good evening. Good evening. Um. Uh. The last speaker. I think I don't remember the full name, but I think I said for you. Okay. Yeah, he said something about um, knowing the right materials to use part time. And I think that's the most difficult part for me because you have these ideas in your head, but then you're not exactly sure where to source the material or the exact name of the material that you want to use. So I'm asking, is there um, a catalog uh, that he could refer us to or maybe books or YouTube videos? basically just share some materials and where we can learn more about these materials and you know associate the images with yeah what we need part time yeah thank you thanks for that chairman 
Um, maybe I can send some links to being able to share with you after this. Uh, the one I would, the one I would share would be uh, a background is generally just using um, lead as an example. Leadership, you know, lead leadership in any uh, environmental and uh, efficient and lead leadership in what's lead again? Energy and environmental design. Yeah, energy and environmental design. One thing they are trying to do because they are pushing people. One of the categories is material and resources. They are trying to make people use sustainable materials. And what yeah. they found out and what is obvious is that it's not easy for the market to react to that. So they're encouraging people to use uh, materials from manufacturers that have declared that their materials are sustainable. I mean, they've run a study, they have data sheets to, uh, to back it. That the, that the materials are sustainable. So there are now websites and government institutions that are collating materials like that. I can share uh, such resources with you. But then again, it has to do with where you are. I don't know if you are in Nigeria or not. If you are in Nigeria, you, you can easily find those things on the internet, but it might be, there might be restrictions on your project. Maybe the cost of bringing those materials in and installing them might not fit the client's budget. Yeah. Or you can bring it in with budgets, but there is no, uh, it's Expert. not easy for the market. There's no expertise to maintain it. Yeah. And then it's not looking good in five years or less and things like that. So you have to consider and balance those things. But for now, where we get local materials is from Building Expo, Akon, um, Colloquium, and Aki Built and things like that. Those manufacturers actually come bring their pro uh, products, make samples and show you. And some of them, sometimes after the uh, conferences, if they know you have a live project, they could bring a sample to your site or your office, Aki office, to show you their product and how it works and things like that. And they are in Nigeria already. So some of those foreign products are already in the country. An example is BASF. BASF is a chemical manufacturer in Germany. They are actually in Lagos. So they, can, they have a um, cold roof material and uh, that's cold applied. You know, you can have the bituminous hot applied roofing material, but there's another one now that is a polyurethane based that you can apply just like paint with the um, foam uh, fiberglass fleece and paint it when it's dry, it's like plastic and water can pass through it. So those companies are actually in Lagos. You have a lot of materials in Lagos. So you would find in Akibut and things like that. So after this, I'll share some links with Binga. And then uh, another thing is, um, you might have materials in your mind or you know the name from the internet, but in Lagos market, they don't call them that name. Yeah. So you might have to move around a lot, really check. Just make sure you have pictures of it, not just the brand name, because that's the thing, that's the mistake some of us make. Or you go to the market with a brand name, but they know it as something else. So if you have pictures and videos and things like that, and you go to the market, you'll find some of those things, you'll find. So, but I will still share links with me. Okay, awesome. But the, please, just to not forget, the key thing is not just picking materials from anywhere. It's actually understanding where, which part of the project do you want, to, which part of the building do you want to use the material? Is it internal exposure? Is it external exposure? is how is the external environment? What is it functioning as? So you won't just put a material that sounds good and works well in UK. You bring it here and then our UV is extremely higher than ours and it fades in one month. So those things you have to consider in knowing the properties of the material and where you want to apply. But feel yeah. free, some of them, if you find a product, sorry for saying too much. Some so it's not common here, but those companies, those material manufacturers, they actually want to sell their product. If you open, um, which one comes up with? Aluminium manufacturer, let's say um, Schluter, no, Schluter is for profile. Yeah, Schluter, for example, they have profiles, plaster stock profiles and pro things like that. If you call the, the number they have on the internet, they always have someone dedicated to talk to architects and they will explain their product, how we can work for you and things like that. Some of these manufacturer websites, you see a button, architects, they are actually willing and ready to talk to architects about their product. So things like that, as not, now that there is internet, you don't need to use normal phone call, you can call over the internet, you can text, you can mail, they will tell, they will sell their product to you, what you are looking for, they will even tell you more than what you are looking for and open your mind to other materials. So feel free to talk to uh, Thank you so much, Architect Tola and Architect. Dr. Michael, this has been insightful. 
closing comment from someone here says, thanks Ayib to JD for these amazing strides at mentoring. I'm an electrical engineer. Um, it's a tip to architecture yet. Conversations are relevant to any professional field. Uh, thanks to Michael and Tola for the expose into real issues and your experiences in the work environment. Uh, many take away from me here today, including sellability and listening to clients. The solution is for them anyway. Um, thanks to JD and all participants. I want to appreciate everyone for the time in here. Uh, thanks for being part of the November edition. We hope to see you next month. Uh, I'll pass it over to Architect Bengalala Day for the closing remarks. Okay, I want to say thank you to our guests and um, thank you also to our audience. I think today has been very uh, interesting for me. Uh, last month, we had about 28 participants uh, on the call right now, about 39. When I counted, when we were full scale, about 50 persons here. And so uh, I think it just lends credence to the fact that our speakers are really uh, sharing very insightful thoughts. And I think even for me today, I've been very, very inciting. Uh, Tola mentioned something about that was that I think aligns with my school of thought. Said so the bigger the projects, uh, the more scientific it gets. You know, that was that was really striking. The bigger the project, the more scientific it gets. Because at that time, you are looking at <laughs> all the parameters must be in place. You know, for instance, we are doing a, a large scale project. When you increase the building height by just 50 mm, that could be about half a billion in some context. And so <laughs> it's critical that uh, these things, you know, mentioned with us are, are really, uh, you know, insightful. And, that, uh, and I think I want to thank our, our speakers and all of us who have taken time to be here. Thank you very much. It's been one hour, 15 minutes of your time. Uh, thank you. I, I mean, people are still turning in at this time. I want to say thank you and hope that next month when we call, you'll be there. Please also help us share the good news. Please, you can follow us on, you know, Instagram. You will see some of the things that Tola and that Dami have shared. We'll put it on, on the page and then we can, you know, get across to you. Also, the link I shared about, put the link on our Instagram page uh, during the week and then you can pick it up. Thank you very much, everyone. Tola and Dami. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. And, and Abraham, my co-host, thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you, you very all much. of us. See you next month. Uh, December 19th will be our next, our next meeting. Uh, thank you very much. And God bless you. Hello, welcome. I'm sure we're going to be having a get together that December edition. So come prepared. It will be something virtual, a get together, um, item seven for everyone. <laughs>